We're here today with the Association, <laughs> the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, and it's to talk about an issue that uh, I thought was interesting to talk about because I really haven't heard anybody talk about this on Capitol Hill in the past week, month, maybe even past couple of months, and that's the implementation of ICD-10. It is in, I think, six days. Uh, if you go to any of the medical websites, uh, it's on there. The countdown clock has been going. I think that we had a briefing about this a couple of years ago, and the countdown clock was happening then as well. Uh, it's a big issue. It's a major change. And uh, so we brought in uh, two doctors to talk about their practices and how it's going to affect them, and also some of what uh, ICD-10 uh, changes might mean to your constituents, and uh, what the way we see it affecting the healthcare market. So on our left, Dr. Juliet Madrigal Dersh. She is uh, one of my uh, uh, favorite stories of doctors. It starts off with the fact that I love the Olympics and she's married to an Olympic gold medalist. Hey. <laughs> but what's awesome is that's one of the uh, uh, least interesting things. She gives discounts to patients that wear in spurs. Uh, she's a graduate of Texas A&M. She was chief resident at OU School of Medicine. Uh, and she does a traditional practice. She makes house calls. Uh, she gives discounts to teachers and preachers. And um, she has fun doing what she's doing, and that's practicing medicine and treating patients. We're also joined by Dr. Uh, Fisher. Dr. Fisher has a more, uh, a more traditional practice in uh, today's market, but he solo, has a solo family practice in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. He went to the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and he's committed to preserving the, the patient-doctor relationship, which is really where we see um, not just ICD-10, but ICD-9 and the way that the codes are implemented in a practice. So this actually gets to, you know, when your doctor comes in, are they looking at you as the patient, or are they thinking about codes in the back of their head? And uh, as a patient myself, and uh, with a family with three daughters, I go into these offices, and I know that a lot of times they're thinking about the codes in their head and how they can write, uh, write up our conversation before they're even out of the room. And that's something that takes extra time and separates from healthcare. So with, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the doctors in the room that know what they're talking about. I'm Dr. Madrigal. Um, as Charlie said, I'm here because I don't do these codes. I'm here because I'm one of the few doctors left who actually just does what regular old fashioned doctors are supposed to do. I work in outside of Austin, and like he said, I give a discount to teachers and preachers. If you come in wearing spurs, that's because of the Aggie. Um, they get $5 off. Um, I do make house calls, especially to people who are really sick, and um, we see people with cancer totally for free, okay? The doctors who take all these codes, they can't do that. If you take Medicare, you can't even legally do that. It's a felony to see somebody for free. So. I do it the old way, and I'll tell you why. Because these codes completely tie the doctor's hands. They keep the doctor from being able to actually take good care of patients. The average doctor spends about 50% of their time doing paperwork now, okay? I spend 100% of my time taking care of patients. This new ICD-10 codes, right now we have about 17,000 codes that we've had since before Charlie was born, okay? The same coding system. So most of us already have this memorized. It's kind of part of our language. They're changing it now to about 68,000 codes. So, the, and the thing is the codes aren't the same at all. Like diabetes right now is 250.00. Everybody knows that. Now it's like VQ12, to, I don't know. So they're totally different. So every time we see a patient now, we have to look it up in a book or type it up or try to find it. So this is a huge difference and a huge problem. Plus the codes are, there's so many more codes now. So for a lot of doctors like me, this is gonna be the breaking point. The doctors who are like me, as far as being in a small town or just taking care of people in solo practice, they can't do this. One of my friends, so we just started where they had to have the electronic health record about three years ago. One of my friends just got all new computers. He changed over to computers, the electronic health record, which I like computers, but a lot of doctors don't, but fine. He's on that. So he had to get all new computers, fine. 
Now, three years later, he has to get all new computers again. He's like, I have to buy 10 new computers. He already did this once, okay? He's a small practice. Now he has to do it again. He's a family practitioner. He makes about 120,000 a year, okay? He's got two kids at college. He's been behind. He was behind three years ago. He's behind again. He absolutely can't make it. He can't, he can't do it. He's like, I'm gonna have to do something else. I can't do it. There's a whole group, an entire group of internal medicine doctors in Austin that instead of implementing the ICD-10 codes, they decided to retire. The whole group went under. So it's a big deal, and that's the thing. It seems like, oh, it's just more documentation, more letters, more numbers, but it's really not. It's more doctors who are leaving. There's a doctor in Houston that started a petition. He had over 1,000 doctors sign it, which represents each of those 1,000 doctors probably represents over 1,000 patients. So nobody wants this. I can't find one. I didn't find one single doctor who wanted this except a doctor who sells this, these books and these computer programs. And the thing about these programs that we need to do these is they're not $5 a pill. They're like $5,000 a pill. Sound familiar? So these are expensive because we have to have them. If you're going to practice medicine with insurance companies, with Medicare, Medicaid, you have to have these programs. You have to use these codes. The other reason these codes are ridiculous is because they're ridiculous, okay? There's one code for a patient who's bit by a macaw. There's another code for a patient who's bit by a parrot. Why, why, okay? If I put the wrong code, it's fraud, okay? There's a code for um, accidental bite to the penis. Really, like I've never seen that, okay? Um, there's one for an accident that happens at a prison swimming pool, okay? I Googled it, there are no prison swimming pools except like in Norway, okay? <laughs> so they're, they're nuts. And the thing is, if you're a doctor, especially if you're working like in the emergency room, there are all, over 20 codes for falls. I was looking this up last night, and again, you have to put where the fall was. There's one code for a fall into a filled bathtub. There's one for a code into a fall into an empty bathtub. There's not a code for a partially filled bathtub. Okay, really? It's ridiculous. And again, if I do the code wrong and I'm one of those doctors, it's fraud or they won't pay for the service that the patient needs. There are three different codes for breast cancer in the left breast. So if I put one for a patient, the surgeon picks the, another one, and then the oncologist picks a third, the insurance companies won't pay for her to get anything done until we make sure it's consistent because they're saying there's something wrong here. There's an inconsistency, okay? And again, the patient doesn't care. The patient wants to be taken care of. Um, there are over 64 codes for migraine, okay? I was looking this up yesterday because I had a little, and I don't, again, I don't have to do this, but I wanted to see what it was like. I had a little kid yesterday who had a really bad headache, which is really weird. He runs around, then he gets a headache, and he starts crying. I'm like, okay, that's weird. That's bad. There should be a code for that. There's no code for that. There's no code for a kid with a weird headache. There's, no, there's only one code for a headache, but there's 64 for migraines. Okay, these don't make sense. And as a doctor, we have our own language, like lungs are pulmonary. When you look up pulmonary, there's... It, it's not there. You have to look up lung. So the codes are not even made by people who are doctors. They're not, there's nothing that's consistent with what actually doctors do that makes these codes makes relevant to us. One of the EMTs that I work with, he said, everything that has to do with ear on these e ICD-10 codes, you have to put right or left ear, even though it doesn't really matter which ear. Like one of them is like inner ear dizziness. And he's like, I don't know which ear it's coming from. You can't tell. So, but he's like, I have to pick right or left. And then I have to remember that I picked right or left and always pick it. But on the other side of the coin, like for um, vocal cord paralysis, which makes a huge difference because if it's on one side, it can be from lung cancer. If it's on the other side, it's usually from the vocal cord. It doesn't, you don't pick a right or left. So they're just absolutely arbitrary and capricious and keep us from actually doing our job. Um, there's 20 pages for bites, 19 bites for falls. Um, 
There's a code for, oh, there's even a code for grandma got run over by a reindeer. Like there is a code for a reindeer injury. Again, I really don't see these things happening. There's a code for um, people who get um, an injury while on water skis due to fire. Again, like I Googled this and there have been no reported cases of this. So um, the thing is, doctors having to do this is keeping doctors from actually being able to spend time with their patients. There is so much new and exciting information coming out every day in medicine that you guys do not want us to spend our time looking up codes and researching codes. You want us to look up, is there a new medicine for migraines? Is there a new medicine for cancer? Is there another treatment that we're not doing that keeps people from losing their hair when they get chemotherapy? That's what you want us to spend our time doing. But with these new codes, none of the doctors are gonna have time for that. We don't have time for that. It's just more and more, it's a ton of paperwork. And it's, they just keep adding it on and doctors, don't have time to fight. The reason I'm here today is because I do have time. I can do what I want with my patients. I get to actually take the time I need with them and I can change my day. The doctors who have to do all these codes and do all these guidelines, they don't have the time to do this. They don't have the time to take care of patients. In that survey, in that petition with over a thousand doctors, almost every single one of them in the comments section wrote, let us spend more time with our patients. Please don't take away more patient time. So the bottom line is these codes don't really help the patients at all either. There's no patient who's like, thank God you wrote down that was an accidental bite. That's not helping the patients. What's helping the patients is me being able to actually spend time with you guys, look you in the eye, understand what's going on. When I was trying to do this on Tuesday, I said, I'm just going to do the old, the whole ICD-10 thing and just see how it goes. So I go through, I ask them all the questions. It was a migraine. So I go through the 64 different codes. I finally find it. I'm like, cool, good, we're good. Any questions? She was like, are you going to examine me or not? I'm like, oh my God, I almost forgot to examine the patient because it took me a good 20 minutes just to figure out what code to put. And the other thing is, you, we can't get anything done until you have the codes. So on Tuesday also, I had a guy who had a really, really bad headache. He had the worst headache he's ever had of his life. It came on suddenly. That's an aneurysm till proven otherwise. I can't get, he has insurance. I can't get his insurance company to pay for it unless I put a special code with it. I don't know what the code is. I, I need a code that says I think it might be an aneurysm. There's not a code for that. I have to put down, I put down headache. There's not a code for worst headache of your life. So I put down headache, unusual type, sudden onset, they won't pay for that. So then I have to go back. I already have an emergency MRI set up for him in an hour. The insurance company gets back to me in 30 minutes. Well, he's gonna miss that one. So then I reschedule it at a different place because that's the only emergency one they have. Finally, I ended up getting it about five o'clock at night by the time I got his insurance to approve it because he was just gonna pay for it, but it was $5,000 just for that out of pocket and he already has insurance. So the thing is, I understand why they have these in theory, but all it's doing is delaying care. And if the guy really had an aneurysm and I didn't have that much time to do this, the guy would have died. Well, that's one less person for the insurance company to have to pay for, but that really would have happened. And that's really not fair to the patients. And the thing is, these companies and these codes, they don't have any correlation between a person. When that comes across somebody's desk, they look at the code, they're like, nope, that code doesn't pay for that test. That's it. They're not thinking, oh my God, this guy could die. This is a really serious thing. This could be terrible. This guy's got five kids, you know? So before I hand it over, I just want you guys to know it's, it's not just a little thing, it's a big thing. It's gonna put a lot of doctors out of practice. There's a lot of doctors who cannot do this either financially or just time-wise. And it's going to decrease care that patients get. And it's, it's just for paperwork. The, me, the numbers just go so they can keep track of, is there a big macaw problem going on? Okay, anyway, Dr. Fisher.
My name is Al Fisher. I'm a family practice doctor from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I would like to let you know about a bill that's out there, H.R. 2126. It's otherwise known as the Cutting the Costly Codes Act. You might want to look this up. But our office and all offices working with Medicare, Medicaid, and other insurances are faced with a new federal mandate that you just heard about, adopting the massively complex new medical coding system called ICD-10. Coding is for billing purposes. Every diagnosis is assigned a code that goes on a bill that will be submitted to insurance. As you heard, ICD-10 replaces ICD-9 on October 1st. Under this new coding system, the number of codes goes from around 14,000 to 68,000. Under the new coding system, there will be 576 codes just for a hip fracture. Can you imagine going to this coding book and going up and down looking for the correct one? This new bill, H.R. 2126, attempts to alleviate some of these burdens on the physicians. Now, we opened our family practice office about 28 years ago, and on the first day that we opened it, our office manager, Elizabeth, who also happens to be my wife, started learning about coding with help from the other small offices in the Oshkosh Clinic building. We have tried to be part of the system. I did the residency program, became board certified, and then recertified over and over. We've worked with the insurance companies, contracted with HMOs, um, complied with the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act, bought malpractice insurance, I got my flu shot. We tried to serve the community. And now, on a day coming up in about eight days, October 1st, everything that Elizabeth has learned about coding will become obsolete and worthless. We are wondering if we will have to close down our family practice office, which is also our family business. Elizabeth and I certainly feel betrayed at this point. She should not have to relearn everything she knows about coding. She has other things to do in her life. So, in order to convert to this new coding system, ICD-10, small offices such as ours would need to buy new computers, new software, and hire expensive consultants. One of these consultants showed up at our office and offered to get us compliant with ICD-10 and other Medicare regulations for $3,000 per month. An increase in overhead like that can put a small office out of business. Nationwide, the costs of ICD-10 are estimated to vary from $5.5 billion to $13.5 billion. It is little wonder that small offices are closing and doctors are selling out to hospitals at an increasing rate. What are the benefits of ICD-10 coding system? After spending countless hours and billions of dollars, the answer is that there is no benefit to the individual patient. The other day I called uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin's office. Her office stated that the senator supports ICD-10. One of her assistants thought that ICD-10 would help with research. It is really incon inconceivable how the useless data from ICD-10 could lead any researcher to a scientifically valid conclusion. The staffer said that the researchers would be able to identify what patients have what condition. And when you, when you think about that, I mean, that's, that sounds like a huge violation of patient privacy. Is anybody even thinking about that? She also said that the health systems and the hospitals have spent a lot of money now on ICD-10. They really want to get started with it. There are coding specialists who want to get a job in coding. In fact, as you learn more about coding, you come to realize that there is a huge industry that feeds on medical coding. I found out that my nurse's son is studying medi medical coding at the tech school. You can get an associate's degree, yet there does not seem to be much recognition of the crippling effects on the doctor's offices of this new overly complicated coding system. The number one priority should be can the doctor's offices use the coding system? 
what the government wants, what the insurance company wants, what the vendors and of software want, that should be a secondary consideration. This new bill, H.R. 2126, would require the Secretary of the Health and Human Services to conduct a study to identify steps that can be taken to mitigate the disruption on providers from replacement of ICD-9 with ICD-10. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. Let's think about this a little bit more. This bill states that no later than six months after the date of enactment of this act, the Comptroller General shall, shall submit to each House of Congress a report in which, or which will include recommendations respecting such replacement and legislative and administrative steps as may be appropriate to mitigate the disruption from such replacement. If the ICD-10 codes are used, or not used, and a physician is still using ICD-9 codes after October 1, physician reimbursement goes to zero. Those claims will be rejected. Zero compensation ranks right up there toward the top of the list for disruptive effects. This means that the physician probably will not be able to pay his nurse, pay the heat and electric bill, and all the other expenses that go with a high overhead uh, operation like a physician's office. Many physicians will decide to opt out of Medicare, Medicaid, and other insurance and become cash-based instead of going through the grueling torture of ICD-10. Physicians are not required to participate in Medicare. It's legal not to do so. Some physicians will retire and leave their chosen profession early. I'm a member of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, a national organization of physicians of all specialties with members in all states. AAPS broke away from the AMA in 1943 to try to better represent the private physicians. AAPS objects to any kind of an initi initiative that would lead to lowering of quality of care or, the do or interfere with the doctor-patient relationship. AAPS believes that coding is not part of the art and science of medicine. AAPS believes that coding is an artificial requirement that has been foisted on the doctors by the insurance companies and the government. AAPS believes that if insurance companies need codes, then they should do the coding themselves. AAPS also recommends that physicians opt out of Medicare to reduce all of these hassles that we're talking about. And many physicians will opt out of Medicare, and I, or will be opting out of Medicare and not using ICD-10 codes. Dr. Chris Held, an ophthalmologist in Texas, says that if she implements this nonsensical, wasteful system, what else won't I do? This is my line in the sand. In other words, if the government can wreak total havoc in a physician's office, as is the case with ICD-10 mandate, and physicians willingly comply, what will the government try to make physicians do next? For her and many other physicians, ICD-10 is the last straw. ICD-10 is added to a long train of abuses and usurpations which evince a design to reduce physicians under absolute despotism, to paraphrase an important document. It is the right and duty of physicians to throw off such government. It is also the right and duty of patients to throw off such government. Dr. Chris Held has written a letter to her patients informing them that she will no longer be accepting Medicare, Medicaid, agree and, and will be terminating all these agreements as of October 1, the day that ICD-10 starts. This is the book that I would like to refer to when I see patients. It helped me to determine the right the diagnosis and the best treatment for the patients. If I have to push this book away and start paging through a code book, then I have less time to study about the patient's condition and come to the right diagnosis and treatment. Coding interferes with quality of care. By diverting attention away from the patient, coding causes a deterioration in the quality of care. 
a majority of physician practices will not even be ready for ICD-10 compliance by the start date of October 1, according to a survey done by the Work Group for Electronic Data Interchange. This study was conducted in June. ICD-10 is likely to cause massive chaos, chaos and other problems. Third-party payers will have a convenient to excuse to deny claims. Experts have advised physicians to take out a line of credit due to disruption in their revenue stream. I mean, can you imagine that? ICD-10 is unnecessary, oppressive, too complex, and it is a waste of time. It may be a threat to, private, to patient privacy. Ultimately, it will force many physicians to leave Medicare and Medicaid. It serves bureaucrats, the coding industry, not patients. So what can we do about this? One thing would be to sign on as a co-sponsor to this bill, H.R. 2126. If we can get this bill enacted and then do the study that it calls for, then maybe some of this damage could be mitigated. In my opinion, the best thing would be to rethink ICD-10 and scrap it. Short of that, there should be exemptions. There should be exemptions for uh, long-established practices and small offices. There should be an exemption for country doctors. Country doctors do not have IT departments. Who really cares about these small practices and country doctors? Well, according to an AMA survey that was recently released, 61% of physicians still work in small practices. Small practices are the backbone of the healthcare delivery system around the world. There would be no downside from allowing an exemption from ICD-10. It does not cost the taxpayers or the government anything. The computers are already programmed for ICD-9. They can handle both coding systems. So we're not here today asking for a government handout. Doctors are reeling from government mandates, electronic health records, meaningful use, alphabet soups that have choked doctors and have done nothing for the patients. There was a time when politicians spoke about administrative simplification. Well, this should be the first thing on the list for administrative simplification. Once that study is done, as directed by this bill, H.R. 2126, there may be other recommendations that would come out. Let's get this important bill passed. It's time to do something to help the small doctor's offices so they can keep their, their doors open. We went to medical school to take care of patients, not do busy work like coding. Thanks. So I do a lot of work with a lot of doctors across the country. Um, one of those doctors is Dr. Uh, Keith Smith. He runs the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Uh, he charges at his surgery center about 20% of what the nonprofit hospitals down the street charge. And a lot of the reason he does that is that um, he doesn't use codes. And what does that mean? He gets to, re he gets to remove uh, FTEs, full-time employees, out of his practice. It's a money savings that gets passed on to the patient who actually, uh, for a lot of his patients, pay no copay when they come and visit him. And it also gets passed on to the employers in uh, either lower, uh, lower insurance rates for their employees or um, no increases is what we're seeing from uh, uh, across the market. And so what we have here are two doctors that are in kind of two different spaces. A doctor who's doing something like Dr. Keith Smith is doing. A doctor who is uh, currently stuck in the system. Um, we have doctors that, and uh, Dr. Madrigal Dersh is uh, somebody who uh, opted out of Medicare right uh, early on in people opting out of Medicare. And uh, if you talk to doctors that have opted out, they uh, practice in a different way, and they still see, I don't know, about the same percentage of, uh, of elderly patients. Um, so I want to get out of the way. I want, we talked about maybe running through some patients, but I also wanted to see if there was questions. The reason why I think that this was an important event for us to have today is that no matter what, your constituents are going to be affected by this, whether they're a patient or a doctor, um, you know, I don't know, how many patients do you see, Dr. Fisher? Probably a couple thousand. A couple of thousand? I have 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of people, when we, when we make a change that affects the way that doctors work, you're affecting a lot of people um,
be behind them. And so that's why it, it gets even more important. I guess, are there any questions about the codes? Any questions about uh, more weird codes? There's plenty of information on that. I know a lot of weird codes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, my question is about um, codes that might have been um, limited in the old coding system, such as autism. The autism spectrum was just one code, and now it's going to be 13 codes to enable them to address the different types of autism as well as Asperger's. Wouldn't you say that the coding system would help these people, especially um, secondary healthcare representatives, to see, okay, this is the exact kind of autism this person has, this is how I'm going to be able to treat them, and to be able to analyze it with big data across um, all the different people who have this specific strain of autism? I think diagnosing somebody is important, but putting a number on them that may or may not be correct later on is not helpful. So, yeah, I think absolutely we need to figure out what kind of autism does this kid have? Where did it come from? Is it preventable to future kids? But putting, changing these numbers and adding a whole bunch of numbers doesn't help the child. Do you see what I mean? Because, and the thing is, when you very first make a diagnosis, you have to pick one of those codes. And the problem is, those codes get stuck to the patient. Like, um, this week, I saw a guy who is terrified he's gonna get Alzheimer's. His dad had Alzheimer's. I don't think he has Alzheimer's, I really don't. But I sent him to neurologist to be sure. The neurologist wants to run a bunch of tests also to be sure. I got a letter back from the neurologist that said dementia, you know, and it has the code for dementia. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I called him, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I feel terrible. I told the guy I was sure he didn't have dementia. Um, I, feel, I feel horrible, what did you see that I missed? And he said, well, actually nothing. I really don't think he has it, but I can't order the test. I can't order B12, I can't order um, these diagnostic tests, I can't do a CAT scan unless I put that he has it. And I'm like, well, that's on his, that's on his permanent record now. It says he has dementia and we don't know if he does or he doesn't. You know, one of the examples is for these, just to show how cumbersome these are, is like, you know when you go to the store and you buy a piece of fruit and you have to put in the code before you weigh it? Okay, pretend like you had to do that with every single thing you bought at the grocery store. And it used to be five digits long and now it's 15 digits long. And then you also have to put in the code, where did you get this fruit on the bend? The right hand side, the left hand side, upper or lower? Are there any bruises on that fruit? Does the fruit look any way atypical? Is it all the way red? Is it somewhat green? You know, if you had to do that for every single piece of fruit, you wouldn't you'd be like, I'm not buying fruit, <laughs> you know? And that's the thing, it's putting labels on people that aren't necessarily helpful. But I'm totally with you. I definitely think we need to spend more time figuring out what's going on. And that's the other thing, like in between patients, he and I, like that kid with that weird headache yesterday, I went and got on the medical sites and I'm like, what is this weird headache that this little kid has where he starts crying for five minutes and then all of a sudden he's normal again? So I'm looking this up. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with him. If I'm him, I can't do that. I have to spend another five, 10, 15 minutes looking up the code to try to get the next test done. And I might miss the test the kid needs because that's a weird case. So, so I'm with you in theory, but I don't, the number wise, and putting all those numbers on there isn't gonna help the kid with the Asperger's or with the autism. There's no plan for those codes to help that kid. I'm curious as to, as to why um, this new system would require purchasing new computer systems. Couldn't it just be software mm. on a computer system? <laughs> um, well, that friend of mine, unfortunately, he bought XP computers, and now it requires Windows 7 or higher. So this new software requires a higher level of computers for a lot of people. Do you see what I mean? So that's a lot of money. Yes? Um, you said that this new ICD-10 is not created by doctors. I believe it's the World Health Organization. Is there any kind of initiative by doctors to create a system that would benefit that because it does seem helpful to have a coding system to kind of organize things but just in a way that would be helpful to doctors. 
Not that I know of. <laughs> I, I feel like that would be more. I do I wish know they that there was a system when that they was, did it. Yeah, I feel like you know. There was a coding system that was created by 3M, I believe, a few years ago um, that just went by the wayside. But they used, they went on something that was more of like a metric scale, where if it was your uh, arm, it was a one. If it was your left arm, it would be one, two. And the ICD-10 codes don't follow that. It's kind of like the uh, numbering in this building. You, you know, uh, no idea what, what floor uh, you're, you're on or where the rooms are going to be floor to floor. And that's really, I mean, uh, you, when, when we think of this in ourselves, and it's one of the problems in communicating this, you know, everybody's like, well, there's a computer that's going to take care of that. But the problem is, is you have to have somebody that's knowledgeable enough in a seat to be able to get where you're at. And when they move off of the codes, off of the words that doctors are using, it makes it even more complex, which really adds to this. Sorry. I, I want to actually ask about the EMRs, but just to that point, my understanding is that the medical specialty societies are actually submitting codes to be included in that sort of um, I don't know. If oh, good, because we need more. Well, that adds to the, the number, which I think most of them are being added by the medical specialty societies. I don't, I don't think so because ICD-11 is actually about to come out, so maybe they're adding, and that's the other thing, they're doing ICD-10 now, but WHO this month is supposed to do ICD-11, so. And, and my question about EMRs, can you walk us through, because my understanding is what we've been showing is that EMRs will help pre-populate the code, the family of codes that the doctors could then select from. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in the EMRs and then what training or services or upgrading your vendors provide for you or what goes into that, into the transition? Do you want to talk about that? Well, I don't know if I can address that, but what I would say is that the impetus for coding does not come from doctors. If it was up to doctors, we would just put a diagnosis <laughs> on the bottom of the claim and then send it in to the insurance and then they can put the code on it. And you, you can do training, but every time, anything you do like that pulls you away from the patients. Like I work, I'm on call 24 seven. That's why he has my phone because it's gonna ring and there's gonna be, I've already taken like three calls today, okay? I work in a small town of 5,000 people, I have 5,000 patients. I don't have them all, people come and go, but still. Um, so if I go and take a training class, it's gonna be like a two day training class. That's gonna be 40 people who don't get to be seen that day. Do you see what I mean? So yeah, there are, vend there are vendors who will love to take your money and will charge you, you know, $3,000 a month, absolutely. And that's part of the problem. The people who want these codes are the people who want more money. Same as the people who are charging thousands and thousands of dollars for a pill that was only $5 a week before. So there's a lot of money to be had because it's so confusing. But our point is it shouldn't be that confusing. There are kids with headaches. There are adults with headaches that might be an aneurysm. Our job is to catch those people. Our job, we don't want to spend our time learning a bunch of numbers when medicine is already complicated enough. We, if we miss one aneurysm or one cancer, our lives are not the same. And that's what these numbers are taking away from us, is the time and the learn. We, we learn every day. We study every night, right? I do. I mean, every dog, <laughs> better. I mean, seriously, like every doctor I know has homework every night. And if we have to go to a ICD-10 class and then an ICD-11 class and then just learn a new computer system, which um, almost everybody had to do in the last three years, that's taking away from actual learning that we should be doing about medicine itself. That's why we're terrified this is going to keep medicine from moving forward. And I don't know if it's you, but uh, I, I was told a story recently and it comes down to the EMR. They can make things each EMR system, and there's a whole bunch of EMR systems. If you want to get in healthcare and move off the hill, it's uh, one of the main things that people off the hill are like, this is great. Government is throwing money at this, like the health exchanges. They just came to this town and, uh, and started EMRs. There's all sorts of businesses. So the consultants are up here asking for more money and then going out and charging money out there. But each business has their own like good innovation. Some of those innovations are getting the right codes together, but that's also like black magic because they're doing it with code 
and not her brain, right? And so while, uh, uh, you know, Google's awesome, uh, you, you put in your search term and they have an am amazing ability and they've made lots of money by getting the top 10 search results that I'm going to use on that first page. Um, the other search engines aren't as good because they can't do that, but they're still bohem, you know, they're still mega companies. And so when you look at the EMR companies, you still have, uh, even if you choose one of them, you aren't sure that you're going to get, get the right one and they're a, a big investment. And then the fact is, is that they only have one innovation better than the other. So people are getting back uh, reports all the time of uh, men that have breast cancer and um, people that have had exams that are only meant for one sex or the other, and, and yet they're coming back. So uh, that's a great like talking point when you're in an office trying to ask for more money for an EMR. But the fact is, is in implementation, they all uh, get long and unwieldy. And uh, when you leave the patient, I was talking to a resident that uh, uh, they said they spend, it's like a minute in the room and 10 minutes outside of the room uh, per patient. And uh, that's right now. When we, when we have to uh, expand from five numbers to 15 numbers, that 10 minutes turns into 30 minutes. And now we start seeing less and less patients, which is the problem. And by we, I mean AAPS. I am not a doctor. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I have a question. Hi, my name is Alexis, and I wanted to know if this, um, these coding things, are they only affecting like smaller practices, or are only smaller practices feeling the greater effect of it, or does everyone have to do this? Everyone has to do this. So, and honestly, the smaller practices financially are the ones who are going to be ruined. However, the bigger practice doctors, I had a doctor call me last week literally in tears. She's in a bigger practice, so financially, it's going to balance out for her. But the number of codes and the way she's going to do it is going to keep her from being the doctor she is now. So it's all doctors, but the small ones financially are the ones that are going to go away. I, I would just like to mention that she talked about ICD-11. That's coming out in just a couple of years. So the people who think about all these things and, and come up with these um, things for us have al are already talking about that. It's in the works, and we may have to go through the, the whole process of buying new computers and new software again. And learning new things. That's, um, yes? I have another question. So is this in set in stone or is there anything that physicians could do to, or, you know, anyone for that reason, like, uh, here, is there anything we can do to fight against these things or is it like set in stone, like what they say is just goes? Well, Dr. Fisher was calling for the passage of a bill, this, but ICD-10 is going to be implemented on October 1st. So uh, just by doing uh, congressional math, there's no way that that's going to happen with a signature from the president. Um, and so right now, this is, it's, this is uh, it's, a, it's a warning briefing, you know? This is what's going to happen to patients and, and doctors in your districts, and this is why. Um, you know, why these bills have stalled, we're, uh, I'm, I'm caught unsure. I'm usually not caught unsure on stuff like this, but, you know, I've been working on it for a while. These guys have been, um, it's going to hit the small guys more than the large hospitals, but that's because they're always updating their systems, always making that investment. And ICD-9, again, it's, it's been around longer than I have. Um, and uh, if it, since, I, since coding doesn't benefit the patient, um, it uh, just makes this one of those things that you're investing in something that's not going to help your patients. That's not the good way to run a business. So, um, Let's see. Do we have any uh, closing statements? I'm going to tell you three. I'm going to tell you codes they should have. On Tuesday, I thought they don't have a code for this patient is drunk and acting ridiculous. They don't have that one. They don't have, a, I think it might be code. And they don't have a code for um, this is the anniversary of my son's death and I feel terrible. And you know what it says in my charts? Those exact things for those three patients. And that's what, I, that's what we want. We want to be able to put in our charts what's really happening with the patients and not these made up codes. Thank you, guys. Um, is the WHO um, willing to speak with people to make the system better? Is there any kind of dialogue between doctors and the organization? Or is it just kind of like this is happening? 
I don't even know if the WHO cares if we do this, quite frankly, because I'm not sure where these numbers are going is the problem. Do you see what I mean? If I put that this kid has autism or this guy was bit by a monkey, I don't, there's nowhere for these codes to go that I know of. Right, but right now, I don't see, why? why? So, I mean, W, uh, WHO produced, it supposedly came out with them in 1900, ICD-1 in 1900 for research purposes. Uh, industry has kind of moved around it. There's legislation from Congress that says that CMS needs to keep up with, uh, with what's going on, but there's no, it's, um, no mandate for how they do that or how it's implemented. Um, and instead I, they're using it for billing. And, that's the problem and the way that it's used for billing it's the implementation of it you know there's a lot of uh, it's good intentions gone bad um the research idea um if that was done if researchers sat in everybody's room and the patient was okay with the researcher sitting in the room finding out if you know it was the anniversary of their son's death great um but that isn't the case uh doctors are being forced to bear the cost themselves uh bear the training of staff themselves and then report on their patients themselves and be held liable if they do it incorrectly. And so that's this, it's the tidal wave of, oh my goodness, where is this coming from? So is WHO willing to talk? Uh, they haven't come to us. Um, at the same time though, this is not being implemented by them. They produce the codes and uh, CMS is implementing them. So, and doing it on their own timeframe that isn't mandated. Let's thank our uh, panelists and thank you all for coming.